All right, so this is uh, incorporating PowerShell into your arsenal with PS Check. Uh, my name is Jared Haight. I'm a security engineer with a company called Gotham Digital Science. Uh, we're a pen testing firm uh, here in the US. When I am not staring at a computer, I enjoy going out into the woods and getting as far away from technology as possible. Uh, I am the co-owner of the most adorable dog on the face of the earth. His name is Eli. And he has no sense personal space and a really adorable underbite. And that has kind of led to this. He has no concept of what the words like no or bad mean. Because he just looks at you with that underbite and it's like, all right, whatever. You can go back to eating bunny poop or digging through the trash or whatever you were doing. Uh, speaking of bunny poop, I also own a really adorable bunny. Uh, his name is Bruiser. And he had a really bad night a couple uh, about a year ago, a little bit over a year ago. Uh, and now his head's stuck like that. Uh, he had a medical issue that has basically led to his head being permanently tilted. So he walks around looking really adorable and really curious all the time. <laughs> so let's go ahead, uh, let's talk about PowerShell. Uh, for, PowerShell's gotten a, a ton of attention in the last uh, you know, couple years, two, two to three years. Uh, it really has picked up uh, a lot of attention, a lot of uh, chatter. Uh, basically, PowerShell is this command line uh, scripting language that Microsoft came up with. Uh, it's just celebrated its 10-year anniversary. It's been around since 2006. And it's a uh, scripting language that Microsoft created to make managing Windows uh, easier. And so what they did is they built it on top of the .NET framework, which is already this very robust uh, API framework that developers can leverage. They built it into this. And basically, as part of that, it gains access to really all the uh, existing Windows man management layers that you might already be familiar with, uh, WMI, COM, stuff like that. So it's a very, very powerful language, ties in with all of Microsoft's existing APIs, uh, very well thought out language. There's a reason why it's gotten such a positive vibe uh, lately. What makes it really cool is being a relatively modern language, uh, Microsoft was able to kind of look at the existing scripting languages that were out there and figure out what worked, what could be improved upon, and that led them to make some really interesting, very, very good conventions. Uh, one of the things which a lot of people hate about PowerShell is it's very verbose. So all the commands in PowerShell have a verb noun syntax. And while that is very verbose, it also makes it really easy to understand what you're working with. Uh, you know, if you're going to set the content of a file with the set content, content commandlet, you can kind of figure out that get content is what's going to read the content of a file. So it makes it really easy once you get used to those verbs, kind of makes it easy to approach PowerShell and really quickly get up to speed and start doing some interesting stuff with the language. <clears throat> The other great thing is it's uh, being a language that was de developed whole cloth by a single entity. Uh, they were able to implement conventions as far as parameters go. So all of the commandlets in PowerShell use similar parameters. Uh, if you need to talk to a remote computer, that is always going to be the computer name parameter, no matter what commandlet you're actually working with. Real different from coming from like Bash, where you know, sed, awk, grep all have their own individual whoops, parameters and stuff like that. You know, you have to really do research on each individual tool to figure out what you're trying to do. PowerShell is a lot more intuitive that way. <clears throat> the other great thing is uh, they have a they from the beginning put a heavy emphasis on their help system. They have a help system that's run through. It's called Git Help. And it's kind of the equivalent of like Linux man pages, except the Git help uh, documentation was actually written by like normal sane people as opposed to like computer doctorates from like 20 years ago that were programming in like C and assembly and developing Linux tools from scratch. Git help actually was written by like normal people who actually use these tools to administer systems. So in a real change of pace, Microsoft actually made a usable help system. Uh, which is greatly appreciated. Uh, there's tab completion throughout the whole thing, all the parameters, a lot of parameter values, all the commandlets, everything you can just tab complete, uh, super helpful. 
And something that's uh, maybe not as obvious of a benefit, unless maybe you're, uh, you have a development background, is that PowerShell is an object-oriented language. So instead of in Linux, when you pipe, uh, you know, you cat something out, you pipe it to grep, you're taking a string of text. And really, whenever you're piping commands in Linux, you're always dealing with a string of text, ultimately. Uh, with PowerShell, you're actually dealing with objects. Uh, so you can take uh, a service from get service and pipe that to restart service. And the restart service automatically knows what to do. It knows how to handle a service object. So really easy to work with, very powerful, uh, really cool stuff. There is some, uh, I've gotten some pushback on calling PowerShell an object-oriented language uh, because I guess it doesn't fit the minutia details of what makes an object-oriented language. Uh, my background is I was a sysadmin for 10, 12 years before moving into InfoSec. I don't have a development background. So looking at PowerShell, you have objects, and the language seems to deal a lot with said objects. So as far as I'm concerned, it's an object-oriented language. So like I said, uh, right now it's being used for a lot of administration. Uh, if you run uh, Exchange Management Console since 2008, I think, uh, the Exchange Management Console is basically just a front end for PowerShell. It's running PowerShell commands in the background. If you run the new Active Directory Administrative Center, which is the replacement for ADOC, uh, users and computers, same thing. It's a GUI that you're interacting with, but you can actually toggle the tab and see all the PowerShell commands that it's running in the background. So really, Microsoft is pushing all of their management to using PowerShell. Um, it's used for a lot of automation. Uh, so if you're familiar with Puppet or Chef, uh, Microsoft recently started pushing out something called Desired State Config, which is kind of their take on systems automation. And it's all powered through PowerShell. And it's uh, because you have this modern uh, network aware language that speaks Windows, works you know, at scale really well, it's an excellent tool for instant response and blue teams. Because you have this you know, uh, language that makes it really easy to query all of the computers in your environment for a specific event log or for the file contents or a hash of a specific file. So really easy to work with. Blue Team's really latched onto it. Uh, I'm not a Blue Teamer. Uh, I'm trying to learn as much as I can, but it's just not my area of expertise. If that's something that you're into, you want to learn more about PowerShell and IR, I definitely suggest checking out invoke-ir.com. Uh, that's a site run by this guy named Jared Atkinson, and really smart dude. Uh, just really, uh, the last time I checked his blog, he had a, a entry on like reading raw file tables using PowerShell and stuff like that, and like reconstructing MBRs and stuff. Like that dude's just crazy smart. So I definitely suggest checking out his site. <clears throat> the dude taking pictures to my right is kind of freaking me out. <laughs> All right, so we're red teamers, right? Like, that's great. We can administer stuff, but how do we break things with PowerShell? And why do we want to use PowerShell to break things? Why is everybody so excited about this or scared? So PowerShell is actually really hard to block. Uh, because it's part of the .NET framework, a lot of people, a lot of CISOs and a lot of uh, you know, IT departments, they say like, oh my god, PowerShell is being used to wreck complete havoc. How do we stop PowerShell? And you really, you really can't. Uh, at least it's not easy. Because uh, it's actually a DLL within .NET. So you can block access to PowerShell.exe. You can block access to like the script editor. You're still not going to block the user's ability to run PowerShell commands, uh, as we'll kind of cover a little bit later. There's also just not a lot of awareness on the sysadmin side. Uh, Microsoft, despite you know, pushing this for 10 years, uh, sysadmins still want to point and click at stuff. Uh, Windows sysadmins, at least, want to point and click at stuff to configure their Windows boxes. Uh, I know this because I spent the last like four years of my career as a sysadmin telling everybody, like, guys, you need to actually learn how to type shit into a console, else you're going to be back at help desk within the next 10 years. And, Nobody would listen to me, and I would teach classes, and I'd be like, look, this is how cool PowerShell is. Here's all the cool stuff I'm doing here with PowerShell. And that would just kind of lead to me writing PowerShell scripts for everybody else in the Windows you know, systems admin department. So 
Windows sysadmins, they really, really like mouses and they're just not aware of what PowerShell can do. They're not looking to block it. They're not, they are not aware of how it can bite them in the ass. This has also led, uh, because of this kind of environment, because PowerShell is so powerful and it's really hard to block and there's you know, lack of awareness, the info, the red team, the offensive security side of the community is really latched onto PowerShell. So a lot of really great developers have uh, kind of latched onto PowerShell and they're doing just incredible stuff with it. And what's great about the guys that are really leading this charge is they're very mature red teamers. So they have very mature methodologies and a big focus on uh, being aware of data forensics and stuff like that. So their tools, they'll make sure they run in memory and they don't leave a trace behind and you know stuff like that. Uh, they also bring with them, a lot of them have a heavy development background. So they bring with them very mature development methodologies as well. Uh, to the point that I really think a lot of the PowerShell scripts that the offensive community has put together, they're really like the gold standard of like how anybody should write a PowerShell script. Uh, Get help totally works with most any offensive PowerShell script out there. Uh, if you guys are familiar with Invoke Mimikatz, that's one of the like big PowerShell offensive scripts. Totally has a man doc, you know, associated with it. You can get help and see how to use the command. Uh, from the way it's actually structured, like it's just a beautifully written script uh, and it behaves exactly as you would expect a PowerShell script to behave. Uh, so just a lot of really good solid work on the Red Team PowerShell side. <clears throat> but we've been talking about PowerShell as a community for years now and there's still a lot of, uh, you know, from the offensive side of things, like People, they, they love their Python and their responder and their Metasploit, and they don't know what to do if they got a PowerShell uh, console. Uh, you know, and on the uh, defensive side, you still have a lot of people that think that the best way to resolve PowerShell is to try to block it. So there's just a lot of lack of knowledge uh, to PowerShell. And I think a large part of that comes from the fact that it's still, development on Windows is not cool. Uh, Windows is not a platform that people look to to develop on or use. Like to us red teamers, Windows is a target. It's not something to be productive on. Like that's what Linux is for. Windows is there so we can get DA and then write a pretty report about how we totally owned everybody's shit. <clears throat> and I think Microsoft has done a lot recently that has made them a cooler company, but they have definitely some cruft that people just don't care about. And so unless you're really following the PowerShell community, unless you're really following like, you know, the offensive, like, you know, Windows sides of things, you're not aware of even just how cool all this stuff is that's coming out. Like a lot of people are aware of Invoke Mimikatz, but they're not aware of like Inve, which is basically a res version of Responder that's totally written in PowerShell. It's super cool. But unless you're in the click in the community, you're, you're just not aware. It's just not cool stuff. <clears throat> The other problem is it's it can be a little intimidating. You know, a lot of pen testers I talk to, like learning Python is still on their list of things to do. They haven't gotten around to it, despite the fact that, you know, we've been using Python to hack shit for the past like 15 years. Uh, to come at them and say like, hey, now there's this new language on this platform you don't respect that, you know, you really should learn. It's just not gonna click. And, you know, where do you start? like? You have this whole new language to learn. Ultimately, you just want to learn how to hack stuff with it. Like you don't care about managing DSC or like Active Directory or whatever, though you should, but we'll get into that in a minute. Uh, you know, where do you start? So I wanted to make something that kind of addressed all of this, right? Like how do we make it easier for people to get started using PowerShell offensively? So that led me to create this tool called PS Attack. <clears throat> and PS Attack is a custom console that allows you to run PowerShell commands. And it's, it's designed to emulate PowerShell.exe, but it doesn't rely on PowerShell.exe. Uh, it has uh, real powerful tab completion. So just like PowerShell, you know, you sit down, you can tab complete commands, parameters, file paths, stuff like that. And it's a single executable. You just download it, run PS attack, and you have this console ready to go. What's cool about this console is it's fully weaponized. So it contains over a hundred commands that cover the full gamut of like what you would expect to encounter on a pen test. 
Uh, so we have commands from more popular frameworks such as Power Tools and Power Exploit. Uh, we have uh, lesser known tools as well, like Invade that I talked about, you know, recently, or PowerCat or DNS Cat, you know, and stuff like that. And then because you end up at the same situation of, okay, I got this scary blue box that I'm supposed to type stuff into, but what do I type? So I wrote a command link called git attack. And git attack kind of functions as a search engine for PowerShell attacks within PS attack. So what you can do is type git attack passwords, and it's gonna return back a list of all of the commands in PS attack that have something to do with passwords. So in this case, you can see we have, you know, invoke mimicats and get GPP password, you know. So real helpful way to kind of get you pointed in the right direction to do whatever it is you're trying to do. And I wanted to create a tool that wasn't just useful for the lab. Uh, so I wanted this to be something that people could actually use on engagements. So one of the things that it does is when PS Attack is built, uh, it downloads uh, all of the tools that it relies on, so PowerSploit and Nishang and Inve and all that. It encrypts them using AES uh, and stores those encrypted blobs within the actual console, within the actual binary EXE. And then when you double click that EXE when you run it, it takes all those encrypted blobs and it decrypts them straight into memory. So the actual uh, malicious files, the raw payloads, never actually touch disk. The computer is not aware that they're there unless it's actually scanning RAM, which is real rare and just doesn't happen. It also doesn't, uh, like I said it before, it doesn't rely on PowerShell.exe. So if you have an environment where you can't run PowerShell.exe, you're probably going to be able to run PS Attack and still be able to run those PowerShell commands. Uh, and it's designed to work on everything from a brand new Windows 7 install to the latest versions of Windows 10. Basically anything that has PowerShell on it, PS Attack should be able to run and be able to uh, wreck some shop. Because it is uh, using uh, the built-in .NET PowerShell, it's basically just a PowerShell console, it still includes access to Git help. So you can figure out what command you're trying to run with Git Attack. And then you can use git help to figure out how to use that command that you found. Uh, one of the great things about git help is it has an examples parameter. So for example, if you run git help invoke mimicats dash examples, it prints out like four different examples of what you can do with invoke mimicats. <clears throat> so let me grab some water and we will do a little demo of how great PS attack is. That was really loud. All right, so in this case, uh, I'm sitting at a Windows 7 box as a low-level user. Uh, so maybe I found some RDP creds that you know I was able to get into somebody's box, or I'm physically on site, came across an unlocked machine, and I dropped PS Tac on there. So we'll go ahead and run uh, PS Tac. And the first thing I'm going to want to do is try to see what I can do to escalate privileges, right? Because I'm a low-level user. I want to try to get around that. So let's do git attack. We can just do priv. See if that works. Oh. Uh, one of the things about git attack, you can see each uh, command has a type. So I tried to group similar types of commands so priv didn't actually give me the command that I wanted for this demo. Uh, so let's do escalation. There we go. So all sorts of cool stuff in here. Uh, a lot of it is provided by uh, the power up package of commands, which is uh, basically a suite for finding typical privilege escalation issues with a Windows box. So uh, services that are overprivileged but run commands that are run exes that you may have write privileges to or unattend.xml files uh, power up is going to be able to help you find all of this stuff the uh, command that i really enjoy running though is called invoke ms 16032 
And this uh, exploits a recent uh, Windows flaw with the secondary logon service that basically allows us to get system creds or system privileges on a Windows box that isn't patched for this. So let's go ahead and just run invoke MS16032. And that's gonna pop us at a command prompt and you can see we have system access on the command or on the computer. So let's go ahead and run PS attack now as system. Now that I have system rights, the next thing I'd want to do is start looking at Mimikatz, right? Because we can use Mimikatz to start uh, getting credentials off the box. Uh, how many people in the room are familiar with Mimikatz? OK, so uh, Mimikatz is really like a, a Swiss army knife of like Windows credentials awesomeness. Uh, what we're gonna see here is it's commonly used to uh, dump credentials from memory on a Windows box. Uh, and that's what most people use it for. You can actually leverage Mimikatz to do all sorts of really cool like ticket-based attacks like Golden Ticket and stuff like that. Uh, in this case though, we're just gonna keep it simple and we're going to uh, look at what we can do with Mimikatz. So let's run get help. And you can see, uh, it gives us a synopsis, uh, some links here, it gives us all the switches that we could use with the command, description, blah, 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 great stuff. Uh, let's go ahead and run, uh, whoops, that's not supposed to happen. Whoops. Okay. Let's try that again. That was a bug in PS attack. It's open source, you're welcome to figure out what caused that and try to fix it. <laughs> All right, so let's do git help. Invoke Mimikatz examples. All right. So we can dump certs, uh, we can dump creds, we can give it a list of computer names to try to dump creds against. So we can run this over the network. Uh, or we can just run straight uh, commands that Mimikatz supports. In this case, we're just going to dump creds, invoke Mimikatz, dump creds. And hopefully the creds that I have staged here will work. I think this bombed out when I did it at DerbyCon. It was very embarrassing. All right. Oh, cool. Uh, so we have the local user's creds. Uh, we are apparently running as B banner with the password of so angry. Uh, there's also a different set of creds that I caught here, uh, a uh, username called backer upper with a password of change me one. I think that's all the creds we'll have in here. All right. So let's... Uh, so we're running a system on in this window. Uh, what I want to do is maybe investigate that backer upper account and see what we can do with that account. So we'll go back to my user account because he has domain access. He can start querying the domain. Uh, so let's do a git attack. Uh, we'll look for a user. This is all privilege escalation stuff. Find user field, find local admin. Oh, almost, there we go. All right, so PowerView is a selection of uh, PowerShell commandlets that are used for recon. Uh, it's part of, it's now part of PS attack, but it's developed by uh, some of the guys out of Barris, uh, Harmjoy and those guys. A uh, lot of really great stuff. What we're going to use here is a command line called git net user, uh, which is really just kind of a replacement for the net users domain command. Uh, but we're going to use this to query that backer upper account. And see what we can find out about him. All right, so we can see that he is a member of the Service Accounts OU. Uh, ba -ba -ba. And he's a member of the Domain Admins group because he's a backup account. So of course we're gonna put him in the Domain Admins group. It's too hard to figure out 
how not to put them in the domain admins group. <clears throat> so let's go ahead and start uh, PS Attack as our backer upper account. All right, so I don't know how much longer I'm gonna have access to this box, right? Like I may be sitting at some dude's cube uh, or maybe I have these RDP creds and he's gonna log in again sometime soon, whatever. So I want to set up some sort of persistence, right? So let's go ahead and do git attack persist. And there is one command uh, because that's the only command that I have written so far. Uh, there is not a lot of persistence commands in PowerShell uh, that work the way I would want them to work. Uh, there, there's, they always seem very like overly complicated. Uh, and for example, scheduled tasks. Uh, Microsoft didn't add support for scheduled task commandlets until PowerShell 3.0, which I think came out with like Vista and won't necessarily be installed on Windows 7 boxes. And it, to set up a scheduled task using the built-in commandlets is like seven different commands or something like that. It's nuts. Like, I just want to be able to say like, hey, at this time, run this command. Uh, so what I did is I went ahead and wrote uh, new scheduled task Z. That way it doesn't conflict with the existing new scheduled task. Uh, so if we do get help, new scheduled task. We can see all the crazy parameters we can run here. Uh, give it a time, we can tell it to run on logon, on boot. Uh, if we do the examples, we can see, uh, I provided three different examples of just different commands that you could run uh, to set up a scheduled task. But I'm going to cheat here. Uh, so, a lot of you have probably seen uh, this right here or something similar. Uh, so what this does is, uh, this is a download cradle for PowerShell. Uh, what it does is creates a .NET web client, tells it to download whatever is at this URL as a string, and then this IX is an uh, alias for a commandlet called invoke expression. So basically what we're saying is, hey, go download this PS1 file and then run it. Uh, this colon then lets us run whatever that was in that PS1 file. So in this case, it's uh, downloading a PowerShell file for uh, invoke Metasploit payload, uh, which is a commandlet that I wrote that allows you to use Metasploit's web delivery module and Power, let's say PowerShell script that will just go out, download whatever payload you're giving through the web delivery module, and it will go ahead and execute it. So in this case, we're running invoke metasploit uh, payload and pointing it to the URL of ponage.example.com slash payload. Then what I did is, uh, and this is another real common uh, PowerShell trick, is PowerShell natively supports commands that are encoded with base64. Uh, they did this to kind of help get around a lot of the issues you come up with where like you're trying to use uh, different quotes or uh, brackets or params, uh, parens in like a command line prompt and like you have to escape everything. This makes it a lot easier because you can just base 64 the entire command. You know it's gonna be safe no matter where you pass it through and PowerShell would decode it and run it. This also makes it a lot, uh, a real benefit for us as red teamers because it makes it really easy to pass these commands over shells or you know, uh, you know, just a real basic obfuscation of the command. So what I did is I took uh, this string right here, and this is the base64 encoded version of this command, all right? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna run new scheduled task. We're gonna tell it to run a time-based task. This is gonna be called updater, and it's gonna repeat every 90 minutes. It's gonna run PowerShell as the backer upper account, password change me one, and when it runs PowerShell, these are the arguments it's going to present to PowerShell. It's going to say it's a non-interactive session, the window is going to be hidden, and here's the encoded command to run. So every 90 minutes, it's going to go ahead and do this. It's going to, every 90 minutes, it's going to reach out to this URL, download this PS1 file, and run invoke Metasploit payload. Uh, before I do that, let me make sure I actually have Metasploit set up.
That is true. Yes. Uh, I'm glad I checked this. Okay, so Python and simple HTTP. I'll go ahead and let this start up. Uh, for those who haven't played around with web delivery payload, uh, pretty straightforward. Uh, so you specify a server host, uh, and that's going to spin up a web server. And then you tell it what payload to give back. In this case, we're going to give back a reverse HTTPS. Uh, and then it just runs. So whenever a uh, box hits this URL, it's going to respond back with that reverse HTTPS payload. All right, so we're gonna run that. It replies back with some XML. Uh, so by default, when we do a time-based task using that new scheduled task uh, commandlet, it's gonna run that task in 30 seconds. One of the things I learned from my DerbyCon presentation is if you're on battery power, a scheduled task doesn't give a fuck and it's not gonna run that scheduled task at all. Uh, so yeah, the, the demo at Derby was a complete fail, it was great. So let's go ahead and cheat here. Uh, we're gonna run this manually. Uh, I almost forgot the password of change me one. That's pathetic. All right, so there's our scheduled task. Let's go ahead and manually run this. Oops. There we go. So we see it come across, download the IMS file. And it should create a payload, or a Metasploit shell. There we go. So web delivery is delivering the payload, and we should get our interpreter shell back. Cool. So we have a interpreter session. And this scheduled task, yeah, that's, you know, if you want to cheer and applaud, that's cool. So yeah, this scheduled task run every 90 minutes. Uh, we're running as a domain admin account. So pretty successful little, uh, you know, 10 minute trip to somebody's computer. All right. Okay, so uh, I think PS Attack is really cool. I think it's, uh, it's a great way for people to get started with PowerShell. Uh, I've tried to make it so that anything you learn using PS Attack will hopefully translate over to actual just regular PowerShell prompts. Uh, but there's definite areas for improvement. Uh, one of the problems that uh, I really wanted to address is that all it takes is for somebody to download that psattack.exe binary and upload it to VirusTotal, and now virus, you know, AVs across the board are going to be start flagging on the psattack binary because it all uses the same encrypted strings. It doesn't matter that they are encrypted at this point. They're part of a file signature somewhere. Uh, the other issue is that the tools themselves are static. So, you know, there's such an active development community in PowerShell that, you know, when we download these, you know, PowerShell tools, we embed them in this binary, you know, within a week, they're out of date because people have pushed out fixes or enhancements or, you know, whatever. 
Uh, so I wanted to come up with a way to make it easy for people to really build their own PS attack, which is why I created the build tool. So what the build tool does is it downloads the latest release of PS attack from GitHub. Uh, it downloads the actual source code for it. It downloads all of the modules and everything that PS attack depends on. It then encrypts those modules with a unique key. It goes through uh, and then obfuscates certain strings within the source code of PS attack. So for example, the actual phrase PS attack, uh, and then uh, takes some of the values that uh, AV had started tripping on uh, and encrypts those, stores those in basically it's like a CSV that, it's an encrypted CSV that PS attack is gonna open up and start reading values from when it's compiled. And then it compiles everything for you, super easy. Like you don't, you don't need to know how to compile stuff. This build tool is gonna go ahead and take care of that. And at the end, you get your own custom made version of PS attack that has unique file signatures. It's completely up to date and hopefully should evade AV for another day. So to demonstrate this, this is uh, basically how easy it is to run the build tool. Whoops, that's not it. For the life of me, I cannot get that video to play when I'm actually doing a presentation. Okay, so all the stuff that I said here, uh, this video goes through that, uh, except it was also really slow because I was on hotel internet when I recorded that. So you're probably better off for not seeing this video. Uh, the cool thing I want to reiterate though is that you don't need uh, to know how to build software for this to work. Uh, it actually leverages a lot of stuff that's in .NET to build the software for you. Uh, .NET provides uh, msbuild.exe, which is the same thing Visual Studio uses to compile C Sharp applications. So I'm just, as long as you have .NET 3.5 and .NET 4.5 on your box, you'll be able to compile uh, PS Tech using this build tool. I also wanted to make it really easy for people to add their own tools. So the way it loads tools is through a JSON file uh, that's just in the root of wherever the build tool is. A real simple format, you just give it a name, tell it where to download the PS1 file from, and now whenever you run the build tool, that will get pulled in as part of PS Attack automatically. So you can add as many tools as you want, you can strip out stuff if for whatever reason you don't want to include something. Uh, real flexible, real easy to use. Uh, both of these are available on my GitHub, uh, github.com slash Jared Haight. Uh, they both come with uh, pre-compiled binaries. So if you don't want to run through the whole build tool thing, you can just go to PS Attack, download from the release file the latest uh, binary exe and run it. Uh, there are, last I checked, there were seven or 14 virus vendors that actually detect PS Attack from GitHub as malicious. So probably only good for lab work, but you know, if you want to just get, get running, that's a really easy way to do it. Uh, the build tool as well has a uh, binary pre-compiled for you. You can just download it, run it, and get your custom-made PS attack. So I wanted to tell a little story. So at last year's B-Sides Charleston, uh, I gave my first like public talk. Uh, where it wasn't just you know uh, 20 friends and you know the little hacker meetups that we have at Charlotte. Like this was, I went through a CFP and like people I didn't know thought I might actually have something to say and be worthwhile. So I gave a talk on uh, an intro to PowerShell and how to use it for evil, and it went really well. Uh, the only thing that I really felt bad about was uh, at the end of the talk, uh, somebody had asked me, uh, how do you defend against you know, this stuff that you've laid out? And what I meant to say was that, you know, look, I, I work primarily in offense. Uh, you know, defense and forensics hasn't really been a focus of mine. Um, you know, so you know, it's kind of something you'd have to research on your own. I don't have a lot to contribute to that. What actually came out of my mouth is I break things, I don't fix them. Which as those words were queuing up, like I already knew like that is the most immature, like you know, that, that's not my approach to InfoSec, like that's such an immature, like shitty thing to say, of course, like, but I said it anyways and it got published to YouTube. But other than that, like it was a super successful talk, like, you know, for a first talk, I was very proud of it. And it was actually incredible because a while ago, a while after the talk, 
Uh, it got published by like Security Tube or something like that. And Jeffrey Snover actually retweeted it and quoted me in it. Uh, if you don't know who Jeffrey Snover is, which you probably shouldn't, uh, he is the, uh, he's a technical fellow at Microsoft, like one of eight. Like it's the highest engineering position you can have at Microsoft. Jeffrey Snover actually created PowerShell. This is his baby. And now he runs like their entire server like line. Like it's, Jeffrey Snover's awesome. Uh, it's why you see things now like server 2016 where like it's, there's no GUI, it's just, you know, console. Uh, he, he is on record of saying like, if a server has a GUI, it, you're doing it wrong. Like it's fucked up. Uh, so really cool dude. And, like this is, you know, the dude that created PowerShell is like fucking talking about me. That's awesome. And then shortly after this tweet, this tweet came out. If you're not familiar with Manifestation, he's like, he's like, he's been my role model for a long time. Manifestation is like really the dude that like took offensive PowerShell to a whole new level. Like he's a genius, super cool dude, like pushes out so much great stuff. Uh, and he was, he was nice enough to not call me out directly on this, but like I tweeted at him, I'm like, dude, you know, you're absolutely right. Like I screwed up, you know, I'm so sorry, blah, blah, blah. So we actually ended up working it out. Uh, this is a completely unedited DM that he sent me. Uh, and I mean, super cool. We're actually, we're, we're on pretty friendly terms now. We talk regularly, uh, you know, things kind of worked out in the end. Uh, if you're not familiar with Harmjoy or Enigma, those are the guys that do Empire, uh, which is another great PowerShell product. Uh, and they are really fun to troll. So what I wanted to do uh, is make up for my B-Sides Charleston talk, right? Because it's important that as security professionals, we're not just here to break shit. Like, we're here to actually try to make things better. Uh, so I wanted to, whoops, hit the right button. And let's talk about actually defending against PowerShell in an enterprise environment. So the, the important thing to know about PowerShell, uh, especially when you're defending against it, is that it's not special. Uh, PowerShell is a post-exploitation framework. Like nobody's popping zero days in PowerShell. They're using PowerShell to leverage existing access to either target uh, other vulnerabilities in the environment or misuse privileges that the account already has access to. So PowerShell is really just a programming language. It's not, or a scripting language. It's not, you know, super special. It's not, it's not Mimikatz, you know, it's, it's just a scripting language. And so really defending against PowerShell uh, really comes back to just basic security hygiene. Uh, you know, talking about like protecting your privileged your, your privileged accounts and logging what's actually happening within your environment and keeping your systems patched. Uh, that really is going to mitigate like 98% of what you see happening in like offensive PowerShell. One of the big things that I see in environments is uh, shared local admin uh, passwords. So, you know, you, you have all these you know, uh, endpoints throughout your workstation or your environment. And they're all using the same local admin password of, you know, and it could be like hyper, like super elite and 20 characters long. But if I can run Mimikatz and, you know, get that password, now I have local admin privs to every single box in your environment. And if those local admin privs can be used to log in remotely to other machines, then like, why do I really need domain admin anymore? Like, I can now just run free throughout your environment and administer everything to my heart's content. Like, as an attacker, I'm not out to do schema upgrades. I don't need, like, you know, domain admin access. I just want to be able to install and run shit on your boxes. So there's a couple ways you can address this. Uh, one is you, you should be randomizing your local admin passwords. Uh, and Microsoft provides a great solution for this that they just don't advertise well enough, I think. Uh, and it's called LAPS. Uh, it is super easy to implement. Uh, it works as basically what, uh, what LAPS does is it installs a client on the local workstation. It extends the Active Directory schema to add uh, a password field to your computer objects. And then through group policy, it just communicates with that client and says, hey, it's time to update your password. The client sends the password to that uh, field in Active Directory. That Active Directory is what's called a protected, or that Active Directory field is what's called a protected field. 
So only your domain admins have access to it initially, and you can kind of dole out access as you see fit. And what's great is you can totally log all of that. And it's also fully supported by Microsoft. Uh, they have gone on record of saying like, hey, if you want to run this and reset your local admin passwords every single day, like you can still call us up and we'll support it. Uh, so super easy to set up, definitely worth looking into, absolutely free. Uh, there is no reason this shouldn't be running in your environment. The other great thing is uh, that should be done is preventing local admins from logging into other boxes. There is really no reason in an environment that a local admin should log into another computer remotely. Uh, and that's another real easy fix through group policy. Uh, you can just update the uh, deny access uh, group policy object to uh, omit local administrators and prevent that from happening. So now with this configuration, if I get a local admin password, it's good for that box and that's it. And it's probably gonna change in 20 days or whatever you have it configured for. So you greatly reduce the risk of just, you know, lose creds. The other interesting thing uh, that I've kind of seen mentioned recently is we regularly approach uh, privileged access, protecting privileged access from a, from a bottom-up sort of standpoint. We don't want lower user, uh, lower level users performing administrative actions, right? So it's also starting to come out that really this idea that you should be approaching this from the reverse side as well. You don't want your domain admins logging into local workstations. There's no reason for that. Uh, you know, your, your domain admin accounts, these high privileged accounts should be used solely for administering the domain. Uh, so many people treat domain admin accounts as basically a, a administrator account. Like, I need to install software, so I'm gonna use the domain admin account. It's like, no, the, the domain admin account is, should be you know, extending schemas and cleaning up AD objects and shit like that. It shouldn't be used for installing Photoshop on an endpoint. So setting up your domain, which uh, is, uh, starts to where you get into privileged access workstations, which uh, Microsoft has a lot of great documentation on uh, that you know, if you go to that link, it kind of links to their uh, documentation on that. But definitely something to look into is you know, administering boxes from a dedicated machine, a VM or something like that, and using those accounts solely for administration, using a lesser user account for your day-to-day -day web browsing and stuff like that. Same boat, service accounts never need domain admin access. Like, they should never need domain admin access. And I know it's really hard when it comes to things like backups and stuff like that, but, you know, you come across so many accounts where it's like, I need the scheduled task to like copy some files from A to B, so I'm gonna run them as a domain admin. It's like, no, that's, that's completely abusing the domain admin privileges. So these real basic concepts, like it addresses most of what PowerShell is being used for. <clears throat> and the other thing uh, that I definitely wanna talk about, uh, and this is just general uh, Windows security, is logging what matters. Uh, when I was a sysadmin, it was really hard for me to find resources on, you know, okay, Microsoft has, you know, fucking like 20,000 event IDs. How do I know which ones actually matter? Jessica Payne is a instant responder for Microsoft, and she put together a great article on uh, login what matters and using uh, Windows built-in event log forwarding, almost as a, a cheap free sim for your environment. Uh, so basically, she covers how to log things like uh, your event logs being cleared, which that should raise red, you know, alarm bells throughout your environment. There's never a good reason for event logs to be manually cleared. Uh, when somebody clears event logs, that logs an event uh, that should be instantly forwarded to your SIM, to your SOC, you know, to your sysadmins, whoever's monitoring this sort of stuff. You can also monitor DCs for stuff like, you know, domain admins or enterprise admins groups being changed. This is a very, okay, thanks. A uh, very rare event that, uh, you know, should be brought to your attention when it happens. Same goes for local groups, local admins. How often is a local account created in your enterprise, you know, on a end user's workstation? It should be once a quarter, maybe. So definitely something you wanna be aware of if that's happening. Uh, same goes for new services. Not something that happens super often. When a new service is created on an endpoint, you should probably be aware that that is happening because that's a great sign of compromise within your environment. 
Now, if we want to talk specifically about PowerShell and how to secure against PowerShell, uh, PowerShell offers insane amounts of logging. Uh, each version of PowerShell creates more and more logs to the point where with PowerShell version 5, which is the most recent version, uh, but you can install it on any you know, Windows 7 and up, uh, offers basically over-the-shoulder transcription logging, where you can see every single thing that's typed into the console, and it gets logged to an event log, and you can ship that out. The other thing uh, is if you are deploying newer versions of PowerShell, make sure to remove PowerShell 2.0 when you do this. A lot of the PowerShell upgrades aren't an in-place upgrade. Excuse me. So PowerShell 2.0 is still going to be available. If you run PS Attack on a box that has both 2.0 and you know 4 or 5.0, PS Attack is going to use 2.0 by default because none of that logins there. So you know I'm going to leverage that. But as an example, this is when you run PS Attack on a box that has enhanced logging. This is the sort of stuff you see. Uh, you can see, hey, we are running Invoke Mimicats right now. Uh, it logs it after all that encryption and obfuscation. None of that matters to the event log. It's logging it right when it's right when it's about to run that script. So when you run PS Attack with logging totally turned up, I think it generates something like 900 some odd events in the event log. Like it is the noisiest like language ever. So in a properly configured environment, PowerShell is the absolute worst thing an attacker can use because it is noisy as fuck. Like, I would much rather go back to Visual Basic or Python or something like that where there isn't that logging. Uh, you know, it's, PowerShell shouldn't be scary. Um, and that kind of leads to some of the last reading that I'll leave you guys off with. Uh, there's uh, GoTPFE did a great summary of the modern state of PowerShell security. Uh, you can get to that at that link there. Uh, Sean Metcalf, uh, if you're not familiar with him, super cool dude, basically the like the voice for securing Active Directory in Windows today. Like just a great guy. Uh, he wrote a great article on defending against PowerShell attack tools. And everybody should just follow Jessica Payne on Twitter and do whatever she says, because she just tweets constant gold as far as like defending Windows and working as an incident responder. A lot of great stuff coming from her. All right, so we talked about PS Attack. Uh, that's the tool that I wrote. Makes it easy to use PowerShell offensively. You should totally use the build tool. Uh, it is open source, so if you guys have any suggestions, uh, feel free to submit either issues or if you know how to code, if you want to submit a pull request, that would be super appreciated. But really, I just love hearing any sort of feedback whatsoever. Uh, you know, if you used it on engagement and it was great, let me know. If you tried to run something and didn't behave the way you expected, I want to hear about that too. So you know, just whatever you want to talk to me about, like or. As long as it's related to PS Tech, I'll, I'll talk to you about it. Uh, otherwise, I have a very small list of stuff I'm interested in, so we'll see if we hit up on that. The last thing I want to leave off on is if you are working in defense, uh, there is no reason to be afraid of PowerShell. Uh, in a properly configured environment, PowerShell is useless to offenders. It, it's, it's crazy noisy. And I want to wrap up with... Uh, if I had mentioned earlier about the PowerShell click that, you know, if you're, if you're not following the PowerShell community, then, you know, you're kind of missing out on all the cool stuff that's happening out there. Uh, this is a great starting point for that click. Uh, these guys are really, they are the people that developed all the cool offensive stuff that went into PS Attack. So definitely worth following them and, uh, you know, giving them the attention that they deserve. A lot of great stuff coming out of that group. And that's it for me. Uh, I am Jared Haight on Twitter. If you want to email me, jhaight at gdssecurity.com. If you're in the Charlotte area, a group of us get together about once a month uh, for Charlotte Hackers Anonymous, uh, where we talk about hacking stuff. Uh, so totally worth checking that out. And all of the links that I posted throughout this talk are available at that website down there, uh, jaredhaight.keybase.pub. Uh, so, yeah, I think we have a little bit of time for questions, or you guys can go run and get food. Question? So, how does the logging handle base64? Does it log the unencoded or log the encoded? 
So yeah, the question is, how does the PowerShell logging handle base64 encoding? Uh, PowerShell logging, what it does is it's going to log everything right before it hits the scripting host, which is the actual engine that runs scripting stuff in Windows. So yeah, it would totally, you would see the decoded uh, command being run. Um, so yeah, same goes for encryption. The only thing that can really mess with it in from what I understand is like obfuscation because it's still legit PowerShell that you're running. There's nothing for it to try to like de, you know, compress or whatever, but you'll still see at least what the obfuscated command was that was run. So any other questions? All right, guys. Well, thank you very much. Have a great time.